Good afternoon and welcome to this Chemistry World webinar. I'm Ben Valsler, Chemistry World's Digital Editor. Thank you for joining us today as we look at medical devices, regulations and chemical characterization. The first thing I'm going to do is just let you know a bit about the software that we're using, which is GoToWebinar. Now, the idea with GoToWebinar is not just that you sit back and enjoy the presentation, but that you get actively involved, you ask questions, and you take part in the polls that we'll put up as well. So the polls will appear throughout the presentation. Uh, what you'll need to do there is just tick on the boxes that are appropriate for your answer. We do find it works better if it's not in full screen mode. So when the polls pop up, just knock it out of full screen mode interact and it helps us to know a bit more about who you are, our audience today. The other key thing about GoToWebinar is that you can use it to ask questions and there will be a Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. There should be a box towards the bottom of the GoToWebinar panel where you can put in any questions that you have at any point throughout the webinar itself. So do feel free to ask anything you like at any point throughout it. Now, the GoToWebinar panel itself can be moved around, different bits can be resized, so make it whatever is comfortable for you as you enjoy today's presentation. So today we are going to be looking at key insights into the medical device regulatory landscape. We'll discuss key aspects of extractable and leachable, that's e &L analysis, requirements associated with the newly revised international standards. So over the course of the next hour or so, you'll gain insight into the medical device regulatory landscape and key aspects of compliance requirements. You'll understand how changes to the international standards will impact chemical characterization and toxicological risk assessments of medical device products. And you will have learned about the application of extraction approaches and conditions in the analysis of extractables and leachables. Today's webinar is brought to you by Waters, who've worked very closely with Hall Analytical because this is an area that they are actively involved in and are very interested in. They work with Hall Analytical to ensure that they do this right and they can advise other people. And in particular, they've worked very closely with our guest speaker today, who is Dr. Andrew Field, and he is the Extractables and Leachables European Strategic Director at Hall Analytical. He's an analytical chemist with over 20 years of experience in the field of trace organic analysis, has become a leader authority on extractables and leachables so he's exactly the right person to have with you today. Now we've actually pre-recorded his presentation to make sure that we can get in everything that we need to fit within the hour and still have time for your questions so we will be going to that video in just a second. Do sit back, relax, enjoy, ask any questions as they occur to you at any point. The polls will come out throughout and we can use those to get to know a little bit more about you. Be it, do get those questions in as soon as you can. So uh, I think that's it for now. Andrew will join us at the end, but right now let's join Andrew's presentation as a pre-recorded video. Welcome to this Chemistry World webinar that has been given by myself, uh, Andrew Field. I'm the European e &L Strategic Director at Hall Analytical. It is myself at Hall Analytical in conjunction with Waters that has given you this presentation on similarities and differences in the chemical characterization of medical devices and medicinal products. So what am I going to cover today? I'm going to give a little bit of background to what are medical devices and medicinal products. I will be avoiding the challenging subject of combination products, so I won't be going into those. I'll be spending uh, quite a, a bit of time on what the regulatory landscape is, especially as that has changed recently for uh, medicinal products. I'll cover some of the key aspects of the regulatory requirements, but then focus uh, more on the chemical characterization requirements and what are the similarities and differences in the regulatory requirements and actual technical requirements for testing uh, medical devices and medicinal products. Simply for uh, a medical device, it is something that acts on the body physically and down to the action is what's its primary mode of action. So does it act predominantly or its main aspect is to act physically? A medicinal product, this is something that acts on the body pharmacologically, immunologically, or has a metabolic action. So something that is normally uh, a, a pharmaceutical will be a med medicinal product, something uh, say like a stent will be a medical device it performs on the body physically 
There are additional challenges around combination products where you may have, say, a stent that has uh, delivers a pharmaceutical. Then it's a question of what is the primary mode of action, and I'm not going to go into uh, that complexity today. There are lots of guidances of what are medical uh, devices. The EU document that's highlighted there runs to 175 pages. It covers all the aspects of what are particular medical devices, what classes and categories uh, those are. Uh, there was planned to be the medical device regulation, uh, an update in May uh, this year. However, due to COVID-19, that's now been uh, extended for uh, another year. So the guidance around that of what needs to be compliant with this new guidance have got more of a, a year to comply with that. I will not be covering uh, any more on the medical device regulations. I'll be covering more of other regulatory requirements. So here are a list of the important things based on the MHRA of medical devices. They're classed into classes one, two, and three. So class one are very simple devices that typically require no testing or simple self-assessment. So these can be wheelchair stethoscopes. And as the device gets more complicated or has more of uh, an impact or longer term impact on the body, the more complex they become and the more testing. So you may have something from a surgical clamp, clamp that's class 2A to uh, lung ventilators that are class 2B, things that have been uh, obviously in, in the news with a lot of people developing those in, in the past few months, all the way up to the most complicated and long term uh, medical devices such as heart valves, pacemakers and, and thing, things like that. So the level uh, that goes up in terms of the interaction with the body, the more the regulatory authority, authorities, whether it be the MHRA or the FDA, require additional or extra information. So in terms of the amount of devices, the vast majority of medical devices that in a single category, class one, so about half of the all medical devices in the world fall under this category. And the vast majority of those do not require uh, much in terms of the regulatory process. So these could be just simple plasters, uh, band-aids, uh, stethoscopes, et cetera, things like that. When we get to more complicated uh, devices that have an increased risk of potential harm or to the patient, we are a lot more fall into this class two. So this may be surgical devices, contact lenses, things that are in permanent or long-term contact uh, with the human body. And finally, the highest risk category of devices. So very small number of these uh, are actually uh, medical devices fall into this category, but these medical devices are usually uh, to say, sustain uh, support life are critical to patient safety, but also are high risk in terms of potential impact. But there is a number of complexities around uh, medical devices or medicinal products. So at the end of this, we'll be asking you a question in terms of what do you think the these particular ones are? So we have a bottle containing uh, saline that's used for clearing nose blockages. The uh, middle one is a bottle containing saline, but it has an additional pain relief and its primary mode of action is for pain relief. And then finally, the, the one on the right, uh, a saline bag potentially used for rehydrating uh, patients. So we'll be now uh, asking a question of what do you think these are? So which do you believe are medical devices. Maybe it's just one, maybe it's all three. So is it a bottle containing a saline clearing nose blockages? Is it a bottle containing saline and also that additional pain relief? Is it a saline IV bag? Is it all three? Is it any combination of the above? I'm just going to give you a few seconds to uh, to vote in that so we can see what, 
which combination people think may or may not be a medical device specifically. Now, of course, this is an area where the regulation will vary between devices and medical products, for example, and so on. So it's good for us to get a good understanding fairly early on as to which of these actually are classed as a medical device. Uh, so I think that's probably enough time now, at least half of you have voted. So let's see what people think. And it's a reasonably even spread. A lot of people think, or just over half of you think that the, uh, the saline for clearing nose blockages is in fact a medical device, but also over half of you, 72% think it's a saline ivory drip. So let's have a look. We had one person in the comments as well saying none of them, which wasn't an option we gave you in the poll. And that might be a bit of a clue as to whether none of them is actually correct or not. What we can do now is go back to Andrew's uh, presentation where he's got the results for us. And in the moment of truth, this is my thoughts on what they actually are. So the saline bottle that's used for clearing nose blockages, its primary mode of action is physical. It's clearing those, those blockages. It's not acting pharmacologically. The middle one is a product because its primary mode of action is uh, for pain relief. So it's acting pharmacologically. And the saline bag is uh, for rehydration. So it's acting pharmacologically. I'm sure a number of people will potentially disagree. And this next slide can show that uh, for medi medical device or medicinal product. In the EU, it can be on a case by case basis and uh, medical device in one state could be a product in another. So now I've given a background to medical devices and medicinal products. I'm gonna now cover a lot of the aspects around the guidances for uh, chemical characterization or more potentially commonly known extractables and leachables. So there are a number of guidances for medicinal products. The PCRI best practices came out in 2005-2006 and runs to 270 odd pages. This then produced the USP guidance, so 1663 for uh, extractables and 1664 for leachables. For medical devices, these have taken, for a better description, a while to catch up. So ISO 10993 part one sets the scene for all the testing. ISO 10993 part 18 is the uh, part that covers the chemical characterization. And this was updated in January uh, this year. So there have been vast number of changes to ISO 10993 part 18, and I'll go into uh, those aspects in a uh, subsequent part of the presentation. And also as it's uh, relevant to potential situation, ISO 18562 has four parts, and this is for breathing pathways, but also for ventilators and CPAP uh, type devices that have been urgently uh, or rapidly developed in the, the past few months. So ISO 10993, it's an international standard with the part one being the biological evaluation of medical devices. So it's carrying out under a risk management process. And with all the guidances, whether it be for a, a medical device or a medicinal product, it's to protect humans from harm. So this is for medical devices, uh, USB 1663, 1664. It's the same premise, the FDA, the, for medicinal products, the device, the container closure system should not call, cause harm to the patient or uh, end user. So as I said, it contains numerous parts and it's describing a range of biocompatibility tests including some of the biocompatibility, maybe cytotoxicity or sensitization, just to, to list a couple. And it was authored by uh, a range of global experts from public and private uh, companies. So the aim of this document, as I said, is to protect humans from biological risks arising from the use of medical devices. With all guidances, uh, especially in the chemical characterization field, it doesn't provide a rigid set of test methods, including pass or fail criteria. It carries out a series of tests and requirements that 
with suitable professionals can interpret the, the requirements and judge the, the evaluation of each device. Saying that, the ultimate arbiter of any data that is put through is the regulatory bodies themselves. And with all input to them, it is gain their opinion before proceeding with uh, any particular study. So in part of this, uh, Annex A has a usual useful table that contains uh, endpoints recommended for the biocompatibility evaluation. And a big part of this uh, revised process in the last few years, plan test report. It's not carrying out every single test that you need to, or you need to carry out every test that's required, but you need to ascertain what tests uh, are required. So one of the things is planning for medical devices is understanding the configuration. So what is the size, geometry, surface properties of the materials that, that it's made from? What, uh, how much of it is present? The physical chemical characteristics of the various materials of construction. Have these been used before? Have they been used in an identical or very similar device? Uh, what information is already out there on the product, on the material? What is likely to happen in its, its end use? What test procedures have been used for, for that? One of the, the potential parts is you may not need to do any testing, but if you plan of what, you, what information you need, you can work out if you need to carry out any, any tests. So the hazards can uh, uh, come from short term, maybe uh, chemical interaction, but also potentially uh, longer term sensitization, genotoxicity, just to, to list a, a, a couple. And if testing is needed, the Annex A in 10993 lists or indicates what are potential uh, endpoints. And as we're well aware of the three R's, in vitro test methods are considered in, in preference to in, in vivo. And if you can reach uh, an endpoint potentially without needing the in vivo tests, all, all, well, all well and good. So you need to provide a rationale for the testing strategy, as well as test selection and what testing you're, you're planning uh, to do. So you need to review the, the test data by a, a range of independent analysis and inform professionals. Part of the, the risk management process is understanding from the materials, what is it made from, how is it made, how is it used. So it's one of the key aspects is the same material may give different results because the same material may be manufactured on a different site, have a different manufacturing process, may be made into a different shape under different conditions that will give a uh, a potentially different output or interaction, potentially differently with the, the body. Uh, it may be in blood flow path, uh, or it may just be subcutaneous. Various aspects can have uh, an impact on what actually comes out. And here's the picture of the table A that mentioned in the uh, annex of uh, 10993 part one. The key part now that has come through on all this testing is that physical and chemical uh, characterization is required to start with. In the past, this may have been uh, a secondary uh, aspect. And you can see on the left-hand side, there are a range of different types of devices that, that the categories of predominantly, is it short-term, long-term or medium-term uh, contact? And it's once you have the physical chemical characterization or information, then its potential of doing the cytotoxicity or sensitization and other tests. There is a different uh, point given by the FDA that do expect different endpoints, but I haven't shown that in uh, today's presentation. So changes to ISO 10993 said it's changed uh, recently in January this year, and it has got a lot bigger. It went from vague information of here a range of, of tests running to, to 17 pages to now to 62 pages long. It now has the definitions of extractable and leachable testing. It now introduces the concept of the AT, which is the analytical uh, evaluation threshold. And this is 
uh, predetermined concentration above which an extractable is expected to be identified and semi-quantified. And it's important to stress as uh, for 10993 part 18, as well as the uh, PCRI guidance, this is an identification threshold. It is never a safety threshold. It is just purely uh, identification. And it's covered a lot more now on extraction procedures, how long, and the analytical techniques. So for medicinal products, this is from the FDA from 1938, a drug is deemed to be adulterated if its container is comprised in whole or part of any poisonous or deleterious substance, which may render the contents injurious to health. It's all about maximizing uh, patient safety. And it's not completely eliminating risk because there is no container or material that is risk-free. And it's the same for the recent 21 CFR uh, 211 guidance. So again, drug product containers, reactive additive resorptive. It's all about safety. So we've seen for medical, prod, uh, medical devices that it's safety. For medicinal products, it's safety. How can the container be as safe as possible? So when we go into study design in uh, working out what is actually needed to do. Um, there is one absolute physical point that is set in all the method development, and it will change over time, and it is the physical, the actual performance of the analytical uh, equipment. At this moment in time, it has a finite sensitivity detectability. It may be in two years, 10 years, 20 years, that level will go lower. But at this moment in time, that is the only fixed point. So when people are designing studies, we know what we need to hit based on the analytical evaluation threshold, which is the point that we need to identify things. So we need to work out how can we go about sample preparation? Uh, what volume of solvent to sample do we need? How many components do we actually need to, to do that? do we need, actually need a concentration step because the level is so low? How much of a concentrate, concentration step can we do? Is a one in 10 okay? One in 100 may be pushing it because the amount of impurities in solvents may be too high. How much can we actually analyze? Could we do the, the challenges of large volume injection maybe on GC as one of the analytical techniques? All challenges that each factor plays off against each other, so designing the, the study is critical in, in achieving the end goal. So the actual extraction techniques or the approaches to take medicinal products mentions singly, ideally more, the more variation or potential understanding of the device, the, the better. Uh, for uh, a medical device, the guidance does say in triplicate multiple batches to show uh, the potential extractable space. Ideally, variation in raw material uh, input, raw batches, different manufacturing processes. Um, and depending on the duration of contact, some medical devices will need repeat extractions. But for both studies for medicinal products and medical devices, the extraction studies should not deform or degrade the material or result in chemical modification because you want to pull out things as much as possible and be as aggressive as possible, but you want to make sure that the chemicals that you are pulling out are representative of those that the patient, the end user will be exposed to. So. Here are some of the extraction conditions for medical devices. A lot depends on the duration of contact. So if it's very short term, so less than 24 hours, uh, exaggerated conditions, so just those slightly worse than maximum clinical relevant conditions are a good place to start with a polar and non-polar solvent. Or you can use a, maybe a polar and a mid-polar if justified. Uh, for prolonged, this is the where it goes over from maybe uh, exhaustive from the exaggerated conditions that are worst case clinical to exhaustive. 
and the exhaustive are multiple extractions of the same device where the level, the final level of extraction should be less than 10% of the uh, initial e extract. The key guidance does point through in terms of using non-volatile residue to determine uh, if the endpoint has been reached, but this does potentially suffer from the, the problem that by conducting the non-volatile residue, you're losing the volatiles, which are typically the larger amount of your extractable leachable species. So there are other ways and means of determining the, the endpoint, but I'm not going to go in, into those in, in today's uh, presentation. And for medicinal products, the typical approach is to reach asymptotic levels. At what point do you reach within 10% of the, the previous study? And this picture is taken from the uh, USP 1663 of showing for different species that endpoint is uh, at different times. So there are ranges of uh, extraction conditions that, that can be used. And some of them are there from gentle, it's barely having anything connected to it, to harsh, which is deformulation. If you wanted to know what was actually in the device it, itself, you would do harsh. Then, the term vigorous or aggressive could be termed for the controlled extraction and actual use and accelerated could be between simulated use. So there are a range of points that will do uh, controlled extraction would be vigorous, but uh, simulated is somewhere between actual use and accelerated. For medicinal products, similar type comments uh, again. And here are a different way of showing the extraction process. So if we imagine we have a block of material in some solvent, and it, if it's in its actual use, we maybe get one species come out. All right, very rare that this may happen. Simulated use, so something slightly harsher than, than in use to see what the potential risks are. We'll see a number of species that can actually come out of the, the sample itself. If we use something slightly harsher, vigorous, a controlled extraction, there is a chance we will pull more out and the very observant of you will see there's potentially a new species. So in the, the picture there, uh, a brown diamond is showing up that something that may not have been present but has been chemically altered. And if you extract it very, very hard, you'll go to deformulation harsh, so you'll get the components as well as potentially a number of the uh, oligomeric chains that have made up that material. So in terms of the exaggerated extraction, as I said, it needs to be at a temperature that exceeds the clinical use at a duration that goes beyond the, the, the clinical use with a solvent or vehicle that is has an extracting power that exceeds that of the clinical use. Not necessarily clean, exceed it by much, but uh, just enough that you are de-risking the, the actual uh, analysis. And it mentions at a surface area volume ratio that exceeds clinical use exposure. And as mentioned on this slide here, there is a potential challenge when complying with this part, ISO 10993 part 18, and ISO 10993 part 12, which covers the preparation of solutions for biocompatibility. So things like the cytotoxicity and sensitization does have a very particular temperature and surface area to volume ratio conditions. So there may be potential challenges uh, around complying with both of these in one study, maybe ne necessitating two different studies. And just thought of one way of presenting the extraction. So the uh, orange curve is for a uh, medicinal product, so achieving asymptotic extraction, but from medical device, uh, exhaustive extraction. And if you work out the area on the curve, this is a, a manually made up drawn graph, but the expectation is of the exhaustive extraction will pull out more overall than the asymptotic because every time you do the exhaustive extraction, you're replacing 
with fresh solvent. So for the asymptotic, you don't replace the solvent, but for the exhaustive, you keep replacing fresh solvent each time. Thank you, Andrew. And there is more from Andrew's presentation coming up and there will still be time for his questions at the end. So do get any questions you have into the questions box and go to webinar down at the bottom there. And we'll make sure to put them to Andrew as we come to the end of his presentation. Let's launch our second poll to learn a bit more about you. So with the EU MDR coming into effect, will you change how you perform extractable and leachable testing? Uh, is that a simple yes, a simple no, or it doesn't really apply to you because you're not doing ENL anyway? We're going to uh, give you a few seconds to make sure as many people vote as possible. It's also a great time to get those burning questions that have been bubbling and get them into the questions box now uh, to make sure that we can put them to Andrew a bit later on. So uh, over half of you voted, that will do. I think we'll close that down and just have a look and uh, see what we're talking about. Uh, so 63% not uh, doing ENL at the moment, but a third of those who answered are going to have to change how you do ENL testing. Well, that means you're in exactly the right place because Andrew, Hall Analytical and Waters are all here to help you. And there will be a survey that goes out uh, immediately after this webinar. We'll also pop it in the email that will follow up with a copy of the recording. Um, do say in there if you would like Hall Analytical or Waters to get in touch, or both uh, to get in touch and help you with your processes. They are more than happy to hear from everybody who's attended today. And with that, we will carry on with Andrew's presentation where he's now going to talk to us about your choice of solvent. And choice of solvents, overall pretty similar. A lot depends for medicinal product, depends on the, the vehicle. For a pressurized meter dose inhaler, you'll use things like dichloromethane, uh, isopropyl alcohol, and maybe heptane. So polar, non-polar, uh, and then intermediate, with the DCM matching or closely matching the propellant that's in the PMDI. If you've got a syringe, you may use just water for injection, uh, IPA, maybe with, with pH adjustment, depending on, on your formulation. A good rule of thumb is if your product is just water for injection, water is a very poor solvent. So the likelihood of pulling things out with water is quite low. So having an organic modifier, even if it's maybe not 100% IPA, will help demonstrate that your extraction method work, is working, your analytical techniques are working, and that you can show the regulators that, yes, I, if it was present, I would pull it out, I, I would see it. In the actual uh, use of the product, maybe just, just water. For medicinal medical devices, this is described in 10993. It generally says uh, two solvents, one polar, one, pol one non-polar, However, the FDA has uh, expressed for permanent medical devices, they want a polar, a mid-polar, and a non-polar solvent. So here is a list of, of those uh, solvents. These are only typically uh, a guide on what can also be used. So saline, aqueous buffered systems could, could be used. Um, however, adding buffers or extra uh, chemicals can make uh, analysis potentially more challenging. So generally a rule of thumb, you will see people that will use uh, water. You may see more people using ethanol or isopropyl alcohol. There tends to be two schools of thought in terms of ethanol versus uh, isopropanol. Isopropanol tends to be less reactive, so you tend to see less re reaction products than if you're using ethanol. But ethanol has a slightly lower boiling point, and you in, in you can pay in when you take your choice in terms of using those and then other options are heptane or, or hexane as the most common solvents uh, used for extraction studies unless there is something specific that's, that's used in the formulation so you've got your choice of solvents now you're potentially pick, picking your choice of extraction techniques and for medicinal products it tends to say at least two extraction techniques so some are listed here and some of the uh, advantages and disadvantages around things like soxlet reflux uh, very very standard 
techniques that have been around. We take Soxlet since 1879. Reflux will be uh, probably the first ones ever in, in, invented and still be here long into the future. Some of the equipment-based ones, maybe microwave extraction, will the equipment be available in the future? And some of the important ones as well, in addition to those, additional will be maybe thermal desorption or headspace, because these have no solvent interaction. So recommendation would be <coughs> to use either a thermal desorption headspace, something that has no solvent interaction, as well as a solvent interaction that enables you to identify all potential species. So if you're pulling out very, very volatile species, you will see they may be masked by your solvent of choice. And the guidance doesn't specifically list any uh, particular extraction technique uh, to pick. And if you do want to know more, I will be posting a number of blog posts on, on LinkedIn in future weeks covering these extraction techniques in a lot more detail. Something that's particularly been relevant, I suppose, in, in the news. So we take details from ISO 18562 for, for breathing pathways. It covers extra things for particulate matter. So the breathing pathways, things used for, as I mentioned earlier, for ventilators and things along the, the lines for CPAP devices. So things that people have been developing uh, very recently for the, the COVID-19. So issues that wouldn't be covered for other medical devices. So leachates from the condensate, emissions of inorganic gases and interaction with specific chemicals. So some of the parts of those that are relevant. So the recent MHRA uh, rapidly ma manufactured ventilator system. So part of those testing was mentioned in those and the same for the rapidly manufactured uh, CPAP systems. So all those were, were, were covered those. And so if you can just about read it, version three on the rap rapidly manufactured ventilator system covered uh, added biological uh, safety section that covered specifically actions around 18562. In terms of the analytical work, this is uh, an area, there is absolutely no difference between a medical device and a medicinal product. So there are potential differences or could be potential differences in terms of your extraction technique, your choice of solvent. However, once you have your choice of solvent and you've produced a solution, the differences are negligible in terms of how you perform it. And in selecting the uh, analytical technique, there is no one single analytical technique that can detect all potential uh, extractables. And you have to screen for all potential targets. So in addition to target analysis, analysis may be required for special case compounds. So for uh, medicinal products, these are things like mercaptor, benzothiazole, uh, nitrosamines, nitrosamines specifically from the container closure system and not necessarily from the, the drug product itself, despite that now being uh, an issue with uh, a number of products. And as you can see on there, screening is now mentioned a lot more times in the uh, ISO 10993 uh, Part 18. So most of the methods, the, the screening methods or the approaches are semi-quantitative in that they may not have been completely validated because you don't necessarily know what, what you're looking for, but the methods will be specific and suitable uh, of use. So just a pictorial representation of the range of analytical techniques that, that are required for, for the analysis. So we have the very volatile GC headspace or thermal desorption uh, GC. The semi-volatiles will cover uh, GCMS, uh, direct injection, electron impact and chemical ionization. The non-volatiles, LCMS with UV, and potentially uh, additional uh, detectors. And then the elemental impurities, ICPMS or ICP uh, OES. So in terms of the calculation of how low to go for the analytical evaluation threshold, this is taken from ISO 10993 part 18. 
So they use the terminology of uh, a dose-based threshold or also known potentially as the threshold of toxicological concern, the TTC, or those are familiar more with uh, medicinal products, the safety concern threshold, the, the SCT. So this equation is used to go, how do you determine how low or designing your method? So how many number of devices you're going to be extracted? What is the uh, extraction volume? How many of those devices are in contact uh, with the, the body? Uh, do you, uh, rarely that you potentially do a dilution factor, but more often than not, you may need to concentrate it up because of your, your sensitivity. And the uncertainty factor in, because you don't know what you're looking for, the response of a given standard to a, in a given analytical technique uh, can vary quite dramatically. So there is more of a span associated with, with those for uh, medical devices and maybe medicinal products. They use the same, maybe a response factor database, but the general uh, span is has been uh, mentioned as wider for medical devices. In terms of the dose-based threshold, it's back to how long is the device uh, in contact with uh, the human body. So if it's uh, between limited and prolonged, so less than 30 days, the, the dose-based threshold is set at 120 micrograms per day. For permanent or long-term, by greater than 30 days, it's 1.5. For uh, medicinal products, this can vary dramatically uh, depending on the route of, man, route of administration, uh, and dosing dura duration. So this can span for maybe uh, a, a one-off for 120 micrograms per day, all the way down for uh, things like ONDP, so orally inhaled and nasal drug products, down to 0.15 micrograms per day. So quite a, a, a span of, of those, and that can have a, a big impact in your actual study it, itself or particularly your study design. So the uncertainty factor. As a rule of thumb, medicinal products, people tend to go a factor of two. Medical devices are now given a span of one to 10, and a lot does depend on the, the technique. Uh, in the guidance, it generally says that GCFID, uh, an uncertainty factor of two is generally accepted. Uh, however, for LCUV or LCMS, it may be greater uh, than 10. And if it is greater than 10, it cannot be applied. Uh, I'm aware of a number of companies and number of activities to try and predict or get better at the uncertainty factor. And in general, there is only one with an uncertainty factor if we overestimate the actual chemical species, then it's of low risk to patient. If we underestimate and potentially miss something that is potentially harmful, then that has the potential to, to cause harm. All the words of potential is all about risk and understanding risk. So a lot of the factors or a lot of the activities is trying to work out how to obtain an uncertainty factor that in an ideal world would be one because we have uh, we know what it is we can obtain authentic standards and get an, an accurate uh, amount so a lot of work is ongoing and trying to get that uncertainty factor down to manageable levels finally in, in conclusion you'll see me talk through some of the difference between medicinal products and medical devices in terms of some of the testing uh, that's required. A lot of the things there are similar, so very similar choice of solvents. The extraction techniques are the same. The analytical equipment is exactly the same. There is no change to the analytical equipment. The subtle difference is potentially in how and when do you determine that the extraction is completed or you've carried out as vigorously enough and a little bit um, in terms of uncertainty factors. We have a final poll to get to know a little bit more about you. 
So uh, let's get that pulled up. So with these regulatory updates, what changes in the level of testing do you expect? And this is for yourselves. So let's give you a short while to vote in that. Now, we've had a lot of very good questions in, and I'm sure Andrew will be delighted to answer them. But we still have time. So if there were any other questions you wanted to ask, do please get them into that box at the bottom of the GoToWebinar, and we'll see how many we can fit in in the next ooh, 13 minutes or so. Uh, and thank you to everybody for attending and for watching the presentation we will be sending you a recorded copy of this in a few days time so if there was anything you weren't sure about you wanted to watch again or just view in your own time then you'll get that recording in your inbox fairly soon and by way of a thank you you will also receive a certificate of participation as a way of th saying thank you for coming along to the webinar so i think that's enough time for people to vote well over half of you voted let's see what those answers are so almost everybody's expecting some change of sorts uh, and a, a, over a third of you expecting that change to be pretty significant. And I guess when you have a large regulatory change like this, then that's what we should be prepared for a significant change in the way that we work. Thank you ever so much to everybody for answering the poll. So I think now is the time to bring Andrew in. So I'll also uh, turn my camera on again so you can see me. I'm not just a uh, disembodied voice anymore. And uh, we'll hopefully get Andrew's camera up as well. And we'll start cracking into some of these questions of yours. So let's pick a good one. Okay, this should be a fairly uh, short and snappy one. Andrew, thank you for joining us. Um, thank you. Ma Marianne Calmel uh, said, way back in slide 23, uh, you talked about NVR testing. Could you just let us know what NVR stands for in that context? NVR, non-volatile residue. So you take your sample, you blow it down to dry ice, weigh it. One of the simplest techniques you can use. Excellent. Um, hopefully that answers your question, Mariel. Uh, Mohammed Islam said, uh, it, when we're talking about point of care diagnostic devices, the examples he gives, uh, glucose sensors or rapid diagnostic kits for things like Ebola and other viruses, of course, do they fall under the same regulation? Potentially, I don't know which class or category those specifically fall into. As I said in earlier on, there's 175 pages of guidance of what ten, or what each device falls under or category it falls under. So the answer is probably, but I don't know that nitty gritty detail of that particular device. Sorry. And certainly not a safe assumption to assume that it doesn't fall under this regulation. The usual thing, check with the regulator, check with your approval body to say, does this require testing? As saw early on, half the devices don't need to. I would say something like this that is contact with bodily fluids, taking on the glucose, probably. But uh, as I said, I'm an analytical chemist. I'm not someone who decides, is it a device, is it, or what level of device is. Check with your uh, regulatory body to see if what is needed. Excellent. Uh, well, maybe this is more uh, in your sort of category. Do we need to test with mid-polar or unpolar solvents if the intended use of the product is for something like skin contact, where it's only going to come into contact with the very polar solvent, human sweat? That's a question from Andre Weiss. So, yes, because the guidance, you want to see what could come out of, of the device. So, if it's in longer term uh, contact with, with the skin, and it's potentially it could be with with damaged skin uh so the permeability through the skin could be be different and it's the the linking to potential medicinal products is along the lines of uh transdermal patches so the transdermal patch you need to test those for the range of solvents because to get a, a product through the skin is quite difficult so unfortunately yes you do need to 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 do that and i'll add to seeing one of the questions that's, that's come through it was about if the solvent you pick damage or degrades the material then you shouldn't use that solvent a whole premise that i didn't go into the presentation in your choice of solvent is that the solvent should not deform or degrade the material that you're extracting so if you do that you will pull chemical species that are not representative of the product so in the early days when i started this 20 odd years ago it was beat the living daylights out of samples reflux it as harsh as possible for as long as possible to pull the maximum out now it's along the lines of designing studies that you just want to be harsh enough because you want to find the chemicals that when you do extraction study 
is going to be found as leachables because a point that wasn't raised and I can go on to talk on this subject for hours is an extractable potential risk. You do the extraction study to select the material. So the leachables are actual risks. So leachables, these are the chemical species that the regulators are concerned about because these are direct patient safety impact. So I know I've waffled on on a couple of questions. Uh, no, that was great. Uh, so I should thank uh, Michael Timothy, who I believe asked that question. He's asked us a few good questions. And if we get time, Michael, we might come back to one or two more of yours. Um, so uh, let's have a look. Oh, this is a very broad question uh, for Dham from uh, Dharma Wati Yunos, who says, what's the most useful analytical equipment for this sort of characterization? I would say the most useful is the analytical chemists themselves of designing the study. You cannot use one single technique. So there is no one single approach to analyze everything that you need. So you need a complete toolbox. So if you're the volatile, semi-volatile, non-volatile and metals, you can't do it with one single one. Right, so you do definitely need a, a spectrum of approaches there at the, to, to make sure that you're you're evaluating everything you may potentially need to look at. Yes. Uh, let's have a look. There will be lots of questions have just come in. Thank you. Thank you for all your questions. Let's see if we can uh, see if we can pick through a couple of these. So, um, oh, now this is this is very interesting from Jeffrey Knight in uh, cutting edge developments. Really, uh, is there any development of regulations in chemical characterization at all analytical with edible electronics? This is very much a new area in edible and implantable electronics. Is that something that Hall are looking at? Uh, at this moment, I'm not aware of looking at, at those, but because they're, it's wood edible fall under food contact regulations, which again are different to the chemical characterization, but a lot of food contact is now looking towards NIAS, so non intentionally added substances. And you've probably heard through the presentation, there is a world of anacronyms in extractables and leachables. So food contact has, has their own and also has their different choice of solvents as well. So you can go from your devices, your products, to your food contact, different choice of solvents for, di for different uses and different assumptions. Uh, speaking of assumptions as well, uh, you mentioned earlier that whether something is a, a medical device, a medical product, et cetera, is pretty much decided on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, but clearly when you're bringing something to market, being to market, quickly is a huge advantage so can you devise a testing regime that will tick all of the boxes regardless of whether the decision is this is a product or this is a device or otherwise is there a set of tests you can run that you know would meet all of those regulations yes you could run the test that would, would cover all those your choice of extraction would be would be larger to span the potential uses if it's a product is it a device but your analysis would, would be the same. So you'd be analyzing more solutions, a slightly different study design, but relatively easy to do. It would be more expensive though. Right, so, well, I guess, of course, if you have to tick all the boxes, then you need to be that bit more thorough. And so if you can afford the delay and then just do the tests that you need to do, then that would be cheaper and, and potentially quicker. Uh, we have had a question about food packaging, actually, it's from Chris Howick, uh, who said, would some of the compliance testing for food contact uh, be of any use if they were to look at medical devices, or do they simply need to go straight through to the, the new uh, 10993 regulatory testing? For medical devices, probably yes. For medicinal products, if your route of administration is solid oral, then food contact compliance is more than sufficient. There is some school of thought and changes potentially for uh, medicinal products that are oral liquids. In theory, it should be that food contact testing is sufficient because if I consume food from that same container, I'm probably going to consume far more of that food than I would as a medicine. However, there are some thoughts from the regulators about potential of doing ENL testing on containers that are for oral liquids. So. For medicinal, so sorry, for medical devices, you'd need to go to 10993 because the solvents and the choice and the applications are quite different to food contact. When you start getting the crossover from food contact to a medicine, then it could be applicable and it may be sufficient at that moment in time. I guess as well, you also have to consider the 
uh, the mechanism of action, how it's going to be used by the patient or consumer. If you're creating a product that ultimately is planned to go into a microwave before it then gets eaten from, then your testing has to reflect a real life example like that, it has to reflect the temperature range and so on. Whereas that's not likely to be the case with a medical device that you're expected to microwave it before you consume it. Or probably the most challenging is high temperature ink. So if you put your product or your food in an oven, in a bag, it has the instructions on the outside of the bag, that's a challenging environment for material to cope with. So that is, yes, has challenges for food contact testing. I've never thought boiling the bag rice could be so complicated. Um, hopefully, oh, we've only got four minutes left. This has gone very quickly. Um, let's try a, a very broad question. This is from a um, Dyer K. Averind, who is a 12th grader, interested in learning more about this topic. Where would you point to people who are beginners uh, in order to learn a bit more, or what resources should they be looking at? There are the, if you want a large amount of bedtime reading, the PCRI uh, best practices for ONDPs that came out in 2005, 2006, it's freely available from their website. It runs to 272 pages so it is quite big and quite long in good blue peter fashion <laughs> if that works on the screen that's the the bible for inhalation activities so i can be smug as i wrote uh, one of the chapters in there if you're in inhalation that's a good book to to go for so to start off try the peak your eye it is quite heavy going for probably for a 12th grader but it's it covers quite a lot of detail, so, and it's free. Oh, it's even better, uh, it's good to be accessible. We only have a few minutes left, but I'm gonna see if I can squeeze in uh, another one of Michael Timothy's questions. He's asked quite a few good ones. If the majority of components of a system have already been tested and approved, and you change the material of one sub-component, do all of the materials need to be retested, or can you just test the new material? No, you just test the new material. So in normal in testing, you test the individual components because it's not a good idea to take all the bits. So uh, take a, a pressurized meter dose inhaler. So an asthma inhaler probably has six or seven different materials. You don't necessarily want to stew those all up together and do your extraction study because if there's a problem, where did the problem come from? So it's take the individual components. So in this example, one, one bit change, just test that. So if you just change the mouthpiece, for example, you don't need to retest the canister that, that contains the actual drug. Exactly. Okay, I think we're running out of time, but let's see if we can just quickly squeeze in uh, Imad Ahmed's question. Uh, how much testing is required to analyze trace metals? Uh, trace metals is probably one of the most well-defined, so you'd, you'd follow ICHQ3D and USP232. So that has permitted data exposure levels depending on your route of administration. So uh, parenteral, uh, inhaled, and oral. So metals is follow ICHQ3D. Excellent. A very concise answer has just brought us to the end of the webinar. So I'd like to say a huge thank you to everybody who attended to all of your excellent questions. I'm sorry we didn't get time to get through them all. Hopefully everybody got something from this anyway and there's plenty to go ahead and think about after the fact. And also a huge thank you to Andrew, to, uh, Andrew Fielden, uh, Ian L, uh, European Strategic Director at Hall Analytical. And also a big thank you to Waters who put us in touch with Andrew, who highlighted this as an area that uh, we should talk about and that our audience would be interested in. Clearly they were right as so many people have turned up today and asked so many good questions. We will send you a copy of this recorded webinar after the fact. You'll get that in a few days if you want to view that again or catch up with any bits that you missed. And we'll also send everyone who attended a certificate. So thank you very much for joining us. I uh, can let you into a secret that there's some brand new content from Waters about the future of plastics. And that's due to go live on Chemistry World's website uh, tomorrow at three brand new 
articles looking at the future of plastics. So if that's something you're interested in and waters have uh, tickled your fancy with this webinar, then do have a look at chemistryworld.com for that new content tomorrow. And also have a look at chemistryworld.com slash webinars for other upcoming webinars that we've got that may be relevant to your work or just relevant to your interests. Always great to hear from you. And it's nice to be able to interact with our community and answer your questions and find people like Andrew who are fantastic for us to talk to. So that's it for now. Thank you very much. I'm Ben Valsler, Chemistry World's Digital Editor, and we'll see you in the next Chemistry World webinar.